Hi everybody and welcome to the Studio Podcast. My name's Lance Wicks and uh, I'm joined today by Unio. All the way from Malaysia. Where can people find you online? Uh, well, you know, there's a Judo Crazy blog that I uh, that I've just started and it's at judocrazy.com and it's where I post almost daily postings on analysis of, you know, techniques and whatever else I find interesting. You're uh, basically the IJF guy who handles all the computer stuff. Uh, yeah, that that's right? right. I'm very fortunate that I'm a member of the uh, EJU and the IGF computer team, so uh, I'm involved with the live stream broadcast of uh, as many events as I can get to. So we live stream all the IJF events uh, on epon.tv via YouTube and that sort of thing. We last met in Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we were there for the, the for the World Championships. That's right. That's what I was doing when we met in Rio. Was uh, just making sure we had you know a, a camera on every mat and uh, we could stream that out and do the video production and that sort of stuff. And that that's my main involvement with what the IGF do. Right. So uh, when people around the world, when judo fans around the world, when they watch the live streams and the recordings, that's because of you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. And well, everybody should be thankful to you. I mean, before <laughs> this, yeah, it's really hard to, to watch judo clips, right? I mean, especially before the IJF YouTube channel was uh, established, it was it's really hard to get judo footage, you know? And now we can watch practically every competition on the IJF, uh, you know, on the IJF roster. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I remember we've moved on, especially now with YouTube streaming. It makes, makes it a lot easier and a lot, lot more accessible. So, yeah, it, it's really nice the IGF has put a lot of commitment, really, to having it at every IGF event. It, it's, you know, it's phenomenal to be part of that team now. In recent years, the IGF has really pushed judo along in ways that are, uh, I think, was unimaginable, you know, just 10 years ago. I mean, judo was such a niche sport before that, and now it's it's very accessible now. You know, you, you can get a lot of information about judo, whereas previously you couldn't. So I, I think a lot of credit goes to the IJF for that. It, it's really phenomenal. I was really fortunate last year I went to uh, the Asian Continental Championships, and I remember going into, sort of, going to bed that night and turning on the TV and sort of flicking through channels and ending up on ESPN and actually watching the footage we had produced live on it, you know, coming on ESPN. <laughs> right. so, it's, so it's a lot more accessible than it used to be. And we're, we're, we're producing content for the TV companies and stuff. And it's been a really rapid change, if you think about it. It's, you know, yeah, it's really, really rapid, happened yeah. since sort of 2007. We've gone from one world championships every few years. There, there's a world championship every year now, and something like, I don't know, a dozen... IGF uh, competitions, aren't there? I mean, Grand Slams, Grand Prix, and Masters. The official calendar has something like 43 events. <laughs> right. But the major competitions, there'll be about a dozen, right? Yeah. You were bang on the money with, you know, the Grand Slams, the Grand Prix, yeah. and the, yeah. the Masters events. So the pace, you know, of developments has been really, very really fast. But something else that's happened really fast is also the change in the, the IGF rules. And that's something we've spoken about quite a bit in Rio as well. And shall we talk a little bit about that now? Yeah, let, let, let's talk about that. Everybody likes to talk about the rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first rule changes happened in 2010 when they first implemented quite drastic changes that effectively banned leg grabs, although there were some exceptions. And when that first came out, everybody was kind of confused. They didn't really know what was going on. And there was all this discussion and at that time, I was collaborating with Fighting Films to produce a book together with Neil Adams called Judo Evolution to talk about, you know, these rule changes. And I went online to look for resources. And guess what? I found a blog posting by a certain fellow named Lance Wicks. Oh, no, and, no. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, that was way, way before I met you in person. You know, it's like three years before I actually met you. And yep. um, so I, and you compared the rule changes and how it came about to rugby rule changes. So yeah, I'm a New Zealander and you know, rugby is a religion to, to everybody from my country and I sort of grew up with it. And I should probably start this whole thing by saying I'm, the post was never about the rules themselves, it was more about the process and it was a comparison really between how the International Rugby Board and the IJF uh, went through the process of changing the rules. But uh, rugby and judo went through a fairly similar sort of situation that at the top a lot of people decided there were some problems with the way the sport was heading. Both organizations decided to change the rules and the IRB basically took 10 years to do it. IRB is the International Rugby Board? That's right, yeah. They're, they're the equivalent of the IJF. 
and they went through a process where they went to a university and asked them to you know, research the subject and coming up with some suggestions for rule changes that would make rugby more pleasant to watch. If you re remember back into the 80s, there was a lot of kick in the ball and there was a lot of play that you know, senior members of the rugby community considered to be ugly or not appealing to TV or to the spectrum. Right, which so is, the, motivation, the motivation was similar. They wanted to make it more attractive for TV, basically. That's right. Yep, yep. The almost exact same argument, making it a, a better spectator sport. So the next stage from there was that the IRB got these sets of rules and then they went out and tested them in various places. So they tested them, I think, within the university structure in South Africa. I know they tested them in the UK and I think in New Zealand as well. And then I think it was, it was either, I think it may have been Britain played a season with the rules in place and they were constantly feeding back to the university and to the IRB with feedback. And then they had a big, a big conference where they pulled in people from all over the world and discussed the rules and proposed more changes to the rules that had been proposed. And those became, uh, what were they called, the experimental rules. And, and that they were tested out for a season, possibly two seasons, so two years. And then they had another huge conference where they got everybody together and they had another review through the rules and then they applied them at the international level and made them rules as, as they were. You know, they, right, so they, the whole process took something like 10 years, right, like, as you pointed out. Yeah, give or take it. I, I worked it out, um, <laughs> forgive my memory, it was, a long, it was a few years ago I wrote the article, but yeah, it took them about a decade. In contrast, the IGF rules were suddenly you know, dropped on our laps just like that. I mean, I, you know, when I first heard about it, it just came out of nowhere and they said it's going to be implemented in a couple of months back in 2010, right? Yeah, that's right. It, it sort of snuck up on everybody. And part of that, you know, I'm sure there were discussions amongst you know, the senior members of the IGF about the rules and where they thought the sport was going and that sort of thing. But really, yeah. in terms of the wider community, it, it didn't, dropped it, it didn't involve the wider community. Well, it didn't involve the wider community. And, you know, back then in 2010, I, I remember talking to Neil, uh, you know, when we were doing the Judo Evolution book and talking to other, you know, people who were fairly high level Judo people and they didn't see it coming. You know, it surprised them as well. And I, I think very few people were involved at that point and very few people knew about it. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that was sort of the gist of what I was po pointing to was the fact that the process was what upset me more than the rules ever. Yeah, it, it wasn't very transparent. Too. Yeah, and, and with the rule changes as they've progressed over the years, most of the time, most of the complaints from most of the people I talk to are not so much about the rules themselves, but about the way they've been rolled out and how they've been devised and like you said, sort of about the transparency of, of that process. And and that a, a relatively small group of people, and if a relatively small group of people even in our community, are deciding what judo is. And one of the big issues I have is when we talk about, you know, some of the maxims of judo about maximum efficiency, if those techniques weren't effective and efficient, people wouldn't have used them in competition. That said, having watched a few yeah. videos from some older tournaments <laughs> recently with all the leg grabs, I'm going, oh, that yeah. looks awful, doesn't it? I, I think it is true that at that point, you know, around 2009, 2010, there was a lot of leg grabbing. That That is true, especially among the lightweights. You know, the 60 kilogram division was all leg grabbing at that point. You know, you can yeah. hardly do proper judo. That's true. Uh, so, so I think there's a legitimate point there. I don't really miss the leg grabs. I always got caught with them myself as a player, so I'm quite pleased they're gone and I wasn't any good at doing them. <laughs> but you know, as a player myself, I, I didn't really do leg grabs, but I did that you know those, that kind of side takedown where you do it's sort of like a, you know, the lats takedown yeah. where you go to the side and you grab the leg and you take them over. So that affected me a lot. I did take a rumor as well, so that affected me. So I, I was when that happened, I was pretty upset. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Uh, I think we both agree that there was a little bit too much leg grabbing going on at that time, and it was getting ugly. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in the lightweight category, it was almost all leg grab at that point. So something had to be done. I think everybody agreed with that. I think the, you know, aside from the point about the transparency and the fact that it, it happened too fast, it was also quite a sweeping ban on leg grabs. Although in 2010, when they first introduced it, there were exceptions, right? I mean, if leg grabs were done as a combination, you know, you do something first, Kouchi, then you leg grab. They allowed it. 
That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah and if you had a cross grip, sense. you could. If your opponent had a cross grip, you could do you it. You could as leg well. grab. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And and also, if they attacked first and there was contact, you can grab the leg. So so there were some exceptions, but then subsequently in 2013, they, they just banned it altogether. It was just completely banned, and yeah. you, you you can't grab the leg at all. That's so, right. And yeah. I think for for me personally, you know, if you're going to have this rule, that was a good change because leading up to that. It was such a quagmire for the referees. This, you know, had they cross gripped? Had they actually grabbed? Was it simultaneous? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Had they made a real attack, or did they just flick their hips a little bit? Yeah, so yeah. Little, exactly. It was hard exactly. for the referees, and that makes it hard on the players. It had to be done because there were too many loopholes, and people were doing. You know, it was so so obvious that people were initiating attack just so they could do the leg grab. When, yeah. But you know what? At the same time, it eliminated a few throws that were really, really beautiful, dynamic. Wonderful throws like you know the the smaja one-handed sode you know yeah that had become very popular and unfortunately that involved the leg grab right you turn in with your one-handed sode and your free hand will grab the trousers and flick the person over yeah because you 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 can't grab the trousers anymore that throw basically disappeared although as one of my blog postings pointed out Seoul from North Korea seemed to have found a way to do it without grabbing the trousers but uh, <laughs> yeah yeah so you know you. You know, after 2010, when they first introduced the, the the ban, players found loopholes and ways around it. You know, and and and, and maybe too much. And then they tightened the rules further in 2013. But I think we're still finding that players are finding loopholes. We saw some of that in Rio, didn't we? Well, absolutely. You know, and the the series of posts you've done on on um has ha, have been really well received and, and have been really highlighting this that. That the players are always going to bend the rules, you know. That's what you do in a sport. You play within yeah. the confines of the rules, yeah. And any, you know, anything you can find, you will use. Some of the your sort of analysis on it hits it right on the money. That these players are phenomenally talented, finding ways to do the techniques that they can. They're not supposed to be able to do. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at um, something you pointed out in Rio de Janeiro itself, which is uh, how Gonzalez was able to uh, you know to bend the rules and, and do a pickup without actually uh, oh, right. yeah. grabbing Sh- shall we look at that yeah you know you were the one who uh, first spotted it and you pointed it out to me and then I went and watched the playback I said yeah actually he did manage to do what looked like an illegal pickup but actually it wasn't illegal because he never at any point grab the trousers or, or the leg. Yeah, that, that I remember us talking about it. Maybe you want to sort of describe what happened. Yeah, well, you know, Gonzalez, as we all know, is a Seonagi specialist, especially Morote Seonagi and drop Sode Suriko Migoshi. And what he would do is, when he drops down, he drops down really, really low and gets underneath his opponent. And sometimes his opponents would literally hop over him in order to avoid getting thrown. And that's exactly what happened when... He fought Lipartigliani. He did a kind of drop Sode Suriko Mikoshi and with his left hand holding on to Lipartigliani's right sleeve and he dropped down. And as Lipartigliani stepped over him to avoid the throw, he held on to Lipartigliani's right hand. He never let go and pulled his uh, Lipartigliani's hands in between Lipartigliani's two legs and, and lifted him using his, Lipartigliani's own arm basically. So it was a very unique thing. He didn't score, but he had Nipatiliani up in the air, and he could have scored, but uh, it so happened he didn't score. But, you know, but at first glance, it looked like a Tegaruma leg grab. Well, and, and it was. He yeah, used it, his arm to, to lift Lipatiliani over, yeah. um, and you know, it could be our claim to fame. I know this was discussed in Malaga at the IGF Refereeing Commission at their right. big meeting just recently this month about the new rules, that that specific fight was mentioned, that no, that isn't a leg grab because he never let go of the grip. He didn't grab the leg. He had his arm. The guy stepped over it or hopped over it or yeah. his arm ended yeah. up between his legs. And he yeah, lifted and he, and he drove, but he didn't let go of the grip at any time. And yeah, so what Gonzalez did is legal. But I guess it's worth asking, is that going to become a common technique? And I don't think so because you know not everybody can do a Morote Sionagi like Gonzalez. First of all, you need to be a Sionagi specialist to do it. And secondly, you need to, to do your Sionagi in such a way that you're so deep underneath them that people are liable to step over and then, then you can lift them up using their own arm. I mean, not. I mean, I think there are very few players who can actually do a Sionagi like that. No, I'd, I'd agree. It's, it's, I don't think we're likely to see it. I've been wrong before, but yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not likely to become a, a, 
a common a technique, technique that people yeah. practice over and over and over. No. But I think what may happen is that seonagi specialists might try it. But if you're not a seonagi specialist, you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. The next topic perhaps could be, uh, you, you notice how Takato managed to do a kataguruma without grabbing the legs. Yeah. He basically did what I guess in Europe is called a Lutz takedown. You know, you know how Johan Lutz and Philip Lutz used to drop down and do a, a kind of Yoko Sutemi and quite often grabbing the leg to assist, but sometimes without grabbing the leg. That's legs. right, yeah. So yeah, using yeah. the head as leverage. But you know what became really popular was the version that involved the leg grab. And a lot of players, especially from Europe, were doing it. And it was one of the, I think, reasons why the rule changes came into effect. Because so many people were dropping down and grabbing the leg and tilting people over. You know, since 2010, when uh, grabbing the leg became illegal, yes. people started developing techniques. I mean, Takato is certainly not the first or the only one to do it, although he does it really well. But several players have developed a way to do the kataguruma without the leg grab. And they, they have basically what I would call a two-on-one grip on, on one side of the body, on, on the arm, really. And In Takato's case, uh, his left hand grabs, uh, usually grabs the, the lapel, his opponent's right lapel. And his right hand grabs the end of his opponent's right hand sleeve, and he would wrap the arm around his head yep. and use his head to drive the person over. Yeah, yeah. It's this key thing of keeping your hands away from the leg. He's not the only one who does it, but he seems to be the the prominent one now. He's the now, star. But I think that technique will become quite widespread. Certainly, it'll, it'll be more common than uh, Gonzalez's technique. I think so. Yeah, that technique or that you know that that sort of area of techniques was really important in terms of showing that no matter what you do, the players will find a way to. Yeah. We said right, you can't you. And everybody was saying, oh, no, no that's it, Carter Groom is dead. And it's not. Yeah. It's just ha got a few more variations. The skilled players will find a way to, to throw each other around it. We have to consider how these rules flow down because I talk to you know club coaches teaching under eights, and they're saying, well, we can't teach Carter Garuma anymore. <laughs> but that's the attitude that's coming through is, oh, we can't do leg grabs anymore. We can't do Carter Garuma. We can't do Te Garuma. I don't think that's the right sort of approach because um, I remember talking to somebody... I think it was Daniel Lasko at an event, and he was talking about, you know, if I give you three letters to make words up, you can't think of many. But if I give you the whole alphabet, you can write sonnets. That's very much what judo is like. Is if we only have a few throws left, it's yeah. not as nice as if a player, if a young person's taught, you know, kataguruma, tegaruma, everything, as well as the rest of the techniques, they can make more throws. But if they don't learn them in the first place, uh, but they won't learn them now, will they? I mean, I, I think judo around the world, certainly in Malaysia, you know, the, the clubs here follow the IGF rules and they're not going to teach tegaruma or leg grabs or, or kataguruma and I, I guess an argument can be made, why should they be teaching it? If, if that club is competition oriented, they really shouldn't be teaching it, should they? Well, yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's the debate that people have is saying that, you know, I'm not going to teach anybody at any age a technique that's banned because it's banned. Yeah. Or, you know, some of the stuff that was in the very old judo books, you know, we don't do leg locks, we don't do neck locks, yeah. we don't lock the spine or anything. We, all those techniques are gone and we don't teach them. What this does is that it makes judo very much more, very much a sport now. Uh, it, it's, it's always been a sport, but by having more and more rules, it makes judo more a sport, doesn't it? You know, those who want to do different types of techniques and, and want to have the, the freedom and the openness to do all kinds of techniques, including potentially dangerous ones, will go to BJJ, you know, or MMA or whatever, yeah. where many more techniques are allowed. So, you know, uh, judo will become even more sports-oriented. Uh, I guess you could debate whether that's good or bad, but uh, I, I think it's okay, you know, that aspect, because I, I personally view judo as a sport. I don't really see it as a martial art or or as a self-defense kind of thing, although it can be, but that's for me, that's not my interest. I've always been interested in judo as a sport. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I would agree that judo, especially since World War II, is a, it's, a, it's a huge international sport. Uh, the founder of our of judo was a member of the IOC, I won't get it. I try and avoid all those. Kano would be spinning in his grave, or Kano Sokano said that, because I, you know, he's not around to defend himself. But I always look at it and go, the man was heavily involved with the Olympic movement, and you know, I always go back to you know, uh, here in Europe we have the European Judo Union, and their little slogan is more than sport, and I think yeah. that's so true and it's so important because it is more than sport, and I keep saying to people, but if you take the sport out of it, it's less than sport. 
Yeah. And we want That's to be true. more than sports, so I, I think it's a good direction. <laughs> but let me ask you this. I mean, you're a, a club coach and you run several clubs. Three, is it? Uh, uh, three, yeah. Yeah, so would you or do you teach Kataguruma or do you teach – would you still teach a, a, a junior player Tegaruma? Uh, my, my sort of approach with the uh, juniors, the, the kids, you know, the very young children, is I teach them the BJ syllabus primarily, which whether I agree with it or not, I teach them the Gokyo. And I also teach them Nagana Kata. Which also and, includes Kataguruma, of course. Which also yeah. includes, which is normally how they learn Kataguruma, in my kids' club at least. It's a hobby that they do and they enjoy it and their parents enjoy it and some of the parents stay and some of the parents go to the gym because they're happy to leave their kids there and all that sort of thing. But I also teach a university judo club where our focus is very much on doing judo as a sport and they all compete um, because it's a sport and that's my approach at that club is it's a, it's a university sports club and they have matches against other teams. I don't tend to teach them very much that's not legal. But, and what but about from your did, perspective? What are you seeing sort of in your side of the world? Are you seeing well, people teaching them or not? You know, in Malaysia, judo is not very popular. But among the, the few clubs that we have here, we follow the IJF rules. So you know, anything that's illegal is just out. But of course, if they learn kata, they'll learn kata guruma. And, but for anything other than kata... Leg grabs are banned, and we just don't, we just, we just don't do it. You just follow the IGF rules. Yeah, I have yeah. it in my club. I have some guys who have come back to judo after you know 20 years off, and I, I have great fun shouting hand sokamaki at them every time they touch the <laughs> leg. Now, yeah, yeah, well, we we have a lot of fun shouting hand sokamaki as well at <laughs> our club. But I, you know, that's the direction judo is heading. I mean, eventually, if you get good, you want to compete. And if you're going to compete, you have to follow the rules. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's for better or for worse, that's the direction judo is heading. But uh, you know, on the whole, I would say the rules have not been disastrous in any way at all. I think it's unfortunate certain dynamic techniques are no longer seen. Yeah. But on the whole, the rules have worked out pretty well. I think. My sort of personal opinion, and it's just a personal opinion, is that the rules are working. That they've made the sport look nicer. And, you know, I think it's the other thing is that when most people are complaining about it or arguing about it is when the rules are just getting bedded in. Yeah. But now yeah. once the players adapt to it, it, yeah. it settles down again. And I, I think the other thing we noticed in Rio was that there weren't a lot of Hansukumakis. There were actually very few. No, that's yeah. right. They, everybody adjusted. I think yeah. they've given it long enough that they'd learned this rule. I, I Personally, I don't like Hansukumaki for a leg grab. I think yeah. the penalty is, harsh. yeah, it, it's not fitting with the crime. The punishment yeah. doesn't fit the crime when yeah. you compare it to all the other hand suck all the other things yeah. you can get hand soccer mucky for oh. are yeah. so much more grave. So yeah. I don't agree with that, but I I think we've seen it. I think we've passed the stage now where the athletes and we're really talking about the top level athletes. You know, in in Europe we saw some players really struggle to adjust. But that, I think they have now, and that, that's, a, that's a good thing that they've adjusted now. And hopefully the rule changes, and I think the rule changes this year are, are very minor compared to 2010. Well, it, it wasn't such a, a culture shock, right? Well, you know, in 2010, it was like a bombshell, and nobody that's expected right. that. Yeah. But um, one aspect of gripping that I noticed that uh, I don't think it's written down anywhere, it's sort of like an unspoken rule, is that did you notice a lot of players are gripping – at the end of the sleeve, almost like what they call a pistol grip. Yes, there's you know a lot what I'm of talking that. about. There yep. was a lot of that. Eliades was doing a lot of that, and the referees were letting it go. And a lot of players were gripping completely at the end of the sleeve, where in the past you would have gotten a shido for that. Yeah, there's a real trend to really grip down low and just push down and put some control there. And, and you can't break the grips off anymore. You can't be breaking the grips every three seconds. So there is. I think they're taking the grip they can get, which you know the bottom <laughs> of the sleeve is an easy place yeah. to get to most of the time. Yeah, but the referees are allowing it, aren't they? Yeah, I, I was a little surprised. I think the referees yeah. started off really tight on them and have yeah. over 2013, uh, the interpretation of those rules has got a little gentler to, to allow yeah. the players to have more time to, to grip to, fight. To, to grip, yeah. I remember talking to Neil Adams about that. He noticed it as well, and he's saying that the referees are just probably being lenient about that. Uh, it's so hard to grip fight in the first place, you know, nowadays. They're just giving some leniency for that. Well, that's right, yeah. And uh, the other one that I'm always surprised that doesn't get a lot of coverage is Naywaza. We get so much time on the ground now compared to what we... The amount of progression time on the ground has really increased, and it hasn't really been commented on by many people. There's some, 
you know, there's some specialist techniques coming out, and it's. I I think it's at a quite a nice level now that it doesn't get too boring. That there's not too much time. I think the referees have got it pretty much right on the nails now that it's allowed to progress, yeah. but it doesn't go yeah. on too long. I criticise the referees, and you know, I write articles that do criticise them and are critical. But these are people who are really passionate about our sport, and. When I look at what they've done, I go, well, yeah, maybe their process was wrong, but the judo looks nice. It's on TV. It's growing. It looks good for spectating, and if we can all sort of keep that positive energy going, I, I think we're in, we're in good shape. That's absolutely true. Yeah. So where are you off to next? You know, for the IJF. Yeah, I've had a bit of time off since Rio. Um, I, I came back to the UK where I live. And uh, tried to make some money so I can afford to go away some more. <laughs> so if right. anybody wants an IT developer programmer, let me know. And the next trip I'm actually doing, I was going to be going to Paris, but I don't think I'm going to the Paris Grand Slam. But the next one I've got scheduled is I'm going uh, to Rome for the uh, Continental Open in Rome, the Women's Continental right. Open. That's for the EJU, is it? Yeah, that's for the EJU rather than for the right. IJF. So when's the next IJF uh, competition? Oh, I need, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember because I was literally just looking at the spreadsheet the other day. Why, why aren't you going to Paris? Uh, I've got to work. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I guess this concludes our first podcast. Um, what are we going to talk about next time? Oh, I know what we're going to talk about next time. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to let you talk about all this great Sianagi stuff you've been putting online on judocrazy.com. The reverse Sianagi. The, the reverse Sianagi, yeah, which yeah. is one of the, the most uh, commonly used technique that is not in the Gokyo. I, I'm going with you on this. <laughs> <laughs> Just to close out, I'd like to thank Un for, for coming on and joining me tonight. And is your book still in print? I'm sure we can get it on Amazon no matter what. Uh, which book are you talking about? Uh, well, yeah, that's going a long way back, but I remember your book about the champions, or the great championships of the world. Oh, that, that, that's been long out of print. I think oh, that I love that book. In, <laughs> it's published in 93, but the, the latest one, the latest book that I worked on was for fighting films. That was in 2010, and it, it was with Neil Adams, and uh, uh, it's called Judo Evolution. It was about the, the rule changes, actually, in, in 2010. Cool, and are you on Twitter and all the social networks? Uh, yes, I am. You know, and, and it's just my name, Unyo O O N Y U H. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on uh, on Twitter. Yep, that's right. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, my name's Lance Wicks. You can find me at uh, judocoach.com or it's at Lance W on Twitter um, and anywhere else you can find me. And uh, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you again real soon.